Today, I'm going to talk about John Austin's paper, Performative Utterances. John Austin was an ordinary language philosopher in Oxford in the 1950s and early 1960s. Much of his work was published uh, just soon after he died at a young age in 1960. This paper, along with his book, How to Do Things with Words, were both published in the early 1960s. And this paper is basically making a shorter version of his large work, How to Do Things with Words. Uh, he is very much in the tradition of Oxford, ordinary language philosophy. He's trying to an analyze how do we actually use language as opposed to the idea that many of the positivists and other early 20th century philosophers had about how should an ideal language behave. He's trying to do very careful observations of how we actually use language. And as you'll see, uh, it may be helpful to imagine a lot of this read in the tone of voice of a uh, uh, a posh British witty uh, professor. And uh, uh, you can find some recordings of his voice online if you want to hear uh, how he actually sounded when talking about this stuff. Um, OK, so he begins. He's trying to define this concept of performative utterances. And the basic idea is going to be, as in the title of his book, How to Do Things with Words. He's saying, philosophers have ordinarily thought that what most of what we use language for is to just state facts that are either true or false. And he's going to suggest and argue that a lot of our use of language is actually to do things. And the words are just different kinds of tools that we can use to perform different kinds of actions. And he's going to suggest uh, if we try to understand how these actions work, under what conditions they succeed, then we'll understand a lot more about language generally, including the ordinary statements, as he'll call them, constatives as opposed to performatives. OK, so let's begin. You are more than entitled not to know what the word performative means. It is a new word and an ugly word, and perhaps it does not mean anything very much. But at any rate, there is one thing in its favor. It is not a profound word. I remember once when I had been talking on this subject, somebody afterwards said, you know, I haven't the least idea what he means, unless it could be that he simply means what he says. Well, that is what I should like to mean. Let us consider first how this affair arises. We have not got to go very far back in the history of philosophy to find philosophers assuming more or less as a matter of course that the sole business, the sole interesting business of any utterance, that is of anything we say, is to be true or at least false. Of course, they had always known that there are other kinds of things which we say. Things like imperatives, the expression of wishes and exclamations, some of which had even been classified by grammarians, though it wasn't perhaps too easy to tell always which was which. So here he's noting that questions and imperatives are usually a different grammatical form in many languages. And there's other grammatical forms that are used in some languages. Some languages have a kind of subjunctive that's used for just a third uh, person wish. Uh, like, uh, let, let there be light is some sort of third person imperative in some languages. But still, philosophers have assumed that the only things that they are interested in are utterances which report facts or which describe situations truly or falsely. In recent times, this kind of approach has been questioned in two stages, I think. First of all, people began to say, well, if these things are true or false, it ought to be possible to decide which they are. And if we can't decide which they are, they aren't any good, but are, in short, nonsense. And this here, he's, I think, referring to the positivists who uh, said that much of the traditional statements of philosophy, including a lot of metaphysics and perhaps even ethics, was in fact nonsense and should just be ignored. And this new approach did a great deal of good. A great many things which probably are nonsense were found to be such. It is not the case, I think, that all kinds of nonsense have been adequately classified yet. And perhaps some things have been dismissed as nonsense, which really are not. But still, this movement, the verification movement was in its way excellent. So here he's referring to the movement of the logical positivists who said, something can only be said to be meaningful if we understand what are the conditions under which we would be able to verify the statement as true. And uh, there are other philosophers who reacted against this. Karl Popper suggested it's not verifying as true, but falsifying that makes something meaningful. Uh, but by the mid to late 20th century, a lot of philosophers were realizing things have to be a bit more complicated. Most statements, uh, whether scientific or otherwise, uh, 
uh, don't have strict conditions under which we already know how to verify or falsify them. As uh, we've seen with the works of Kripke and Putnam, they suggest often we have a, an idea of what thing we're talking about, and there's indefinitely many ways that science could in the future develop new ways to test for whether something is that thing. And so we don't already have in mind a specific set of conditions that would count as verifying or falsifying the statement. Uh, and many other statements uh, about things in the mind, for instance, uh, often are said to be connected to many other statements, but not directly verifiable or falsifiable, only as part of a broader theory of the mind or as part of a broader theory of the world. But still, the idea that uh, something where we can't figure out any way to confirm or disconfirm, verify or falsify, uh, many philosophers have thought that means it's nonsense. And that has led them to classify a lot of metaphysics and ethics as uh, not meaningful. And uh, various philosophers have since tried to rescue some of that while maintaining the insight that a lot of other statements really are nonsense. Okay, however, we then come to the second stage. After all, we set some limits to the amount of nonsense that we talk, or at least the amount of nonsense that we are prepared to admit that we talk. And so, people began to ask whether, after all, after all, some of those things which treated as statements were in danger of being dismissed as nonsense, did, after all, really set out to be statements at all? Mightn't they perhaps be intended not to report facts, but to influence people in this way or that, or to let off steam in this way or that? For instance, this is what many of the positivists said of the statements of ethics, that while it's not true or false, they think, to say that murder is wrong, they think, the statement murder is wrong is nevertheless meaningful because the role of that statement is to express your dislike of, the, uh, of murdering and to express the idea that we as a society have decided not to murder. Uh, of course, many philosophers since then have uh, thought this is still not quite enough and have tried to save those moral statements as direct statements that are true or false, but there's a lot more interest in exploring other ways that these statements could be used. Or perhaps at any rate, some elements in these utterances performed such functions, or for example, drew attention in some way without actually reporting it to some important feature of the circumstances in which the utterance was being made. On these lines, people have now adopted a new slogan, the slogan of the different uses of language. The old approach, the old statemental approach is sometimes called even a fallacy, the descriptive fallacy. I think here he's referring to some ideas that follow from the work of Ludwig Wittgenstein, who says language is a tool that we use and we should analyze the ways people use it and not just assume that they are making statements. And Austin, I think, is following in that tradition, but he's, I think, doing much more sophisticated and specific work than a lot of the other people. Certainly, there are a great many uses of language. It's rather a pity that people are apt to invoke a new use of language whenever they feel so inclined to help them out of this, that, or the other well-known philosophical tangle. We need more of a framework in which to discuss these uses of language. And also, I think we should not despair too easily and talk, as people are apt to do, about the infinite uses of language. Philosophers will do this when they have listed as many, let us say, as 17. But even if there were something like 10,000 uses of language, surely we could list them all in time. This, after all, is no larger than the number of species of beetle that entomologists have taken the pains to list. So here I think he's saying uh, it's not okay to just go around and take any statement that we haven't yet figured out how to analyze and say this is just another use of language, another uh, term to add to our catalog, and people can always keep making up more, so uh, there's nothing to do but keep listing them. Whatever the defects of either of these movements, the verification movement or the use of language movement, at any rate, they have effected, nobody could deny, a great revolution in philosophy. And many would say the most salutary in its history, not if you come to think of it a very immodest claim. So uh, around the middle of the 20th century, there is this idea that there's been a recent turn in philosophy towards understanding how language works and doing philosophy through understanding language. This is often called the linguistic turn these days. And uh, uh, the idea is that by understanding language, we can solve many of the questions of philosophy. Now, this hasn't been 
Uh, there's been a lot of pushback on this, but I think this is the idea that Austin is talking about. And at the time, people were very much in favor of this and thought it was a huge revolution. And uh, in the early 20th century, it focused on the idea of replacing ordinary language with a more precise logical language. And then by the middle of the 20th century, it had become trying to understand how language, as we've already used it, works, and trying to fix the problems of philosophy by showing that they are just mistakes about language, rather than uh, uh, solving the mysteries by finding something real in the world. Now, it is one such sort of use of language that I want to examine here. I want to discuss a kind of utterance which looks like a statement, and grammatically, I suppose, would be classed as a statement which is not nonsensical, and yet is not true or false. So I think here he's saying, uh, we've already understood that grammatically some sentences aren't statements. There are sentences like, hooray, which is just a single word, no verb, no noun, not a statement. There are sentences like, close the door, and what time is it? that are grammatically not statements because they are commands or questions. But he's going to get to some sentences that are grammatically the same form as ordinary statements. Uh, but he's going to say, nevertheless, it's neither true nor false, but it's also not nonsense. And this is going to be the class that he calls the performative. He's also going to say, these are not going to be utterances which contain curious verbs like could or might, or curious words like good, which many philosophers regard nowadays simply as danger signals. So could or might, these are modal verbs. These are about what, not what is the case, but what might be the case, could be the case, should be the case, would be the case, had been the case, will be the case. All of these things uh, uh, are definitely stranger sorts of concepts and harder to explain than statements about what is in fact now the case or what is in fact now not the case. And uh, so many philosophers at this time were worrying about the modal verbs. In the contemporary era, philosophers and linguists have come up with a lot of interesting analysis of modal verbs and are no longer so worried about them, but still modal verbs uh, provoke a different sort of analysis than ordinary direct statements. And words like good, these are what philosophers call normative terms. And these are also connected to certain modals, things like should and ought and may and can. Uh, and again, many philosophers by the middle of the 20th century were skeptical of any sort of ethical or normative claims. But he's again going to say, these are not going to be ethical or normative claims. These are not modal claims. These are not commands. These are not questions. And yet, nevertheless, they are not true or false and still meaningful. They will be perfectly straightforward utterances with ordinary verbs in the first person, singular, present, indicative, active. And yet we shall see at once that they couldn't possibly be true or false. So first person singular means I, present, that's the present tense now. It's not about the past, it's not about the future. It's indicative, that means it's saying what is, as opposed to in the imperative, or in some languages there's other moods like interrogative or optative or subjunctive. This isn't going to be any of that, and it's active, not passive. So it's, in some ways, the simplest possible grammatical sentence. Furthermore, if a person makes an utterance of this sort, we should say that he is doing something rather than merely saying something. This may sound a little odd, but the examples I shall give will, in fact, not be odd at all, and may even seem decidedly dull. I think that's a bit of self-deprecating humor here. Here are three or four. So now he's finally going to give us the examples of these performatives. Suppose, for example, that in the course of a marriage ceremony, I say, as people will, I do take this woman to be my lawful wedded wife. Or again, suppose that I tread on your toe and say, I apologize. Or again, suppose that I have the bottle of champagne in my hand and say, I name this ship the Queen Elizabeth. Or suppose I say, I bet you six pence it will rain tomorrow. In all these cases, it would be absurd to regard the thing that I say as a report of the performance of the action which is undoubtedly done, the action of betting or christening or apologizing. We should say rather that in saying what I do, I actually perform that action. When I say I name this ship, the Queen Elizabeth, I do not describe the christening ceremony, I actually perform the christening. And when I say I do take this woman to be my lawful wedded wife, I'm not reporting on a marriage, I'm indulging in it. 
So notice all of these sentences, they're sentences with I. I do take this person to be my spouse. I apologize. I name this ship. I bet you. In all of these cases, it's first person singular present indicative active, as he notes. And uh, as he notes, if we had these in the third person, if I said he does take her to be his wife, or I said he apologizes, or I said he's naming this ship, or I said he's betting, in those cases, I would be reporting on an act. But when I say it about myself, I don't seem to be reporting on the act, I seem to be performing the act. That's what he means. Now, these kinds of utterance are the ones that we call performative utterances. This is rather an ugly word and a new word, but there seems to be no word already in existence to do the job. The nearest approach that I can think of is the word operative as used by lawyers. Lawyers, when talking about legal instruments, will distinguish between the preamble, which recites the circumstances in which a transaction is affected, and on the other hand, the operative part, the part of it which actually performs the legal act, which is, is the purpose of the instrument to perform. So for instance, if you look back at the stay at home order issued by the county and state back in March of last year, you'll see the first part begins with a bunch of, whereas there is an unknown virus, whereas there's a health emergency, whereas uh, the state wants to keep people safe, hereby let it be ordered that everyone should stay at home except if they're doing something essential. So that's that letter part, that latter part is the operative part of the order. And it is stating, it is, it is not just stating what is being ordered, that document actually is the order. It actually carries out, it carries the force of law. And so this is what he's arguing here, that there are certain statements that actually do things. They don't just report on things that are being done by some other means. So the word operative is very near to what we want. I give and bequeath my watch to my brother would be an operative clause and is a performative utterance. Here he's imagining a will, which says something like at the beginning, if I should die without further statement of how my belongings should be uh, uh, given, then I give and bequeath my watch to my brother. And the idea is that uh, this document actually has the force of, uh, uh, of bequeathing. And uh, that is an act that is done with words in a legal document. However, the word operative has other uses and it seems preferable to have a word specially designed for the use we want. So this is why he's using the word performative because this word doesn't exist elsewhere in the language at this point. Now at this point, one might protest, perhaps even with some alarm, that I seem to be suggesting that marrying is simply saying a few words, that just saying a few words is marrying. Well, that certainly is not the case. The words have to be said in the appropriate circumstances, and this is a matter that will come up again later. He's eventually going to talk more about these conditions under which saying words can actually do certain things. But the one thing we must not suppose is that what is needed in addition to the saying of the words in such cases is the performance of some internal spiritual act of which the words then are to be the report. So I think this is a major argument of this paper. He's going to argue that uh, it's not the case that marrying or naming or any of these other things is a mental act which the words merely report. He's going to argue that if we said that, we'd allow way too many consequences and that's not going to be acceptable. The words themselves actually perform the act whether or not you've got the mental thing going on if you're in the right circumstances. And, uh, and so this is, I think, an important argument for him that the action is done by the words and not by the mind. It's very easy to slip into this view, this view that the mental act is the actual act rather than the statement, at least in difficult, portentous cases, though perhaps not so easy in simple cases like apologizing. In the case of promising, for example, I promise to be there tomorrow. It's very easy to think that the utterance is simply the outward and visible, that is verbal, sign of the performance of some inward spiritual act of promising. And this view has certainly been expressed in many classic places. So this is the idea he's saying, some people might think that all it takes to promise is to have a certain thought and intention to be there tomorrow. 
and that the statement is just a way that you tell someone else that you've already done this promising. There is the case of Euripides' Hippolytus, who said, my tongue swore to it, but my heart did not. Perhaps it should be mind or spirit rather than heart, but at any rate, some kind of backstage artiste, something that is inside the uh, person and not external. Now, it is clear from this sort of example that if we slip into thinking that such utterances are reports, true or false, of the actual act, the performance of inward and spiritual act, we open a loophole to perjurers and welshers and bigamists and so on, so that there are disadvantages in being excessively solemn in this way. So that sentence, very quick, that was the argument. He says, here's, the, here's a view someone might have. To promise is to make a certain internal mental act. To say I promise is just to report on that act. And then uh, he says, if we say that the internal act is the actual act and the saying is not the promise, then we should say, uh, if someone says I promise to be there tomorrow and didn't make that internal act, then they wouldn't actually have promised on this view. They would have lied when they made the statement, but they wouldn't be breaking their promise when they didn't show up tomorrow. They would just say, oh, I was just lying when I said that. I didn't actually promise. And he says, no, I think that seems wrong. I think it's true that you promised. You didn't make a false statement when you reported that. He thinks the right thing we'd want to say is you actually promised. So if you don't share, show up, you're breaking the promise. Whereas if you, didn't, uh, if you didn't make the internal mental act, that means you promised insincerely, but it doesn't mean you didn't promise. That's, I think, the, uh, the example that's supposed to go against this other theory. He says, it is better perhaps to stick to the old saying that our word is our bond. That is, if you've said I promise, then you have in fact promised. It doesn't matter what went on in your head. And perhaps conversely, it doesn't matter how much you intend to be there tomorrow. You haven't actually promised until you've said or done something to communicate that intention to promise. However, although these utterances do not themselves report facts and are not themselves true or false, saying these things does very often imply that certain things are true and not false, in some sense at least of that rather woolly word imply. I think this is, the, this is related to the idea that Grice is going to get to a few years later, the idea of implicating, where it's not what you said, but it's something else that you've communicated along with having said something. For example, when I say, I do take this woman to be my lawful wedded wife, or some other formula in the marriage ceremony, I do imply that I'm not already married with wife living sane, undivorced, and the rest of it. But still, it is very important to realize that to imply that something or other is true is not at all the same as saying something which is true itself. That is, if you stand up there in a marriage ceremony and say, I do, but in fact, you actually are already married and you haven't been divorced, then we wouldn't say you lied when you said I do. We, we would say, no, the, this new marriage ceremony was just invalid. And you've led everyone to believe that you're not married, but you didn't lie when you said it. It would be very different if you had said, I'm not married. And then in that case, we would say you have lied uh, if you are in fact married. But, uh, uh, but in this case, it's not that this thing you said was false. It's that the thing you said just failed to work because one of its presuppositions was false. Presupposition is a term that linguists have used for many of the things that are need to be true in order for a statement that is made to be meaningful. So these performative utterances are not true or false then. That is, he's saying, when you say I do, you aren't saying something true or saying something false. You are doing the marrying if, in fact, uh, you're in the right conditions. And if you're not in the right conditions, then you are pretending to marry. But either way, you're not saying something true or false. Similarly, if you say, I promise to be there tomorrow, you are not saying something that is either true or false. It's not the same as saying, I think I'm going to be there tomorrow, or I will be there tomorrow. In that case, you might be saying something true or false. Uh, but it, when you say, I promise to be there tomorrow, you are not saying something true or false. You are just promising. 
So these performative utterances are not true or false then, but they do suffer from certain disabilities of their own. They can fail to come off in special ways, and that is what I want to consider next. The various ways in which a performative utterance may be unsatisfactory, we call, for the sake of a name, the infelicities. Felicity is, Felix is the Latin word for happy, and so he's going to use felicity and infelicity uh, for the conditions under which one of these performative utterances is happy or unhappy. And by that, he means, does it work and actually do the thing that it's supposed to be doing, or does it somehow fizzle and go wrong? So the various ways in which a performative utterance can be unsatisfactory, we call for the sake of a name, the infelicities. And an infelicity arises, that is to say, the utterance is unhappy, if certain rules, transparently simple rules, are broken. I will mention some of these rules and then give examples of some infringements. First of all, it is obvious that the conventional procedure which by our utterance we are purporting to use must actually exist. In the examples given here, this procedure will be a verbal one, a verbal procedure for marrying or giving or whatever it may be. But it should be borne in mind that there are many nonverbal procedures by which we can perform exactly the same acts as we perform by these verbal means. So that is saying, you might be able to promise without using words. You might be able to give something without using words. Maybe you might even be able to marry without using words. Uh, but all of these are going to depend on in these cases, these are social conventions. Giving depends on a concept of ownership. Marrying depends on a concept of being married. And in all of these things, there are so, certain social conventions about how you do it. It may be that in some cultures, the thing that you have to do to get married is to walk in a circle around your parents three times with your spouse. In other cultures, maybe the thing you do to get married is to put the ring on the finger and you don't necessarily have to say anything. In other cultures, maybe the thing that actually marries you is signing the document in the courthouse. But in some cultures, the thing that gets you married is saying, I do. It's worth remembering too, that a great many of the things we do are at least in part of this conventional kind. Philosophers at least are too apt to assume that an action is always in the last resort, the making of a physical movement, whereas it's usually, at least in part, a matter of convention. So here, I think the idea he has in mind is, uh, there's a certain physical movement that is involved in picking up a certain shaped piece of wood and moving it a few inches and putting it down. But if we have agreed on certain conventions, then that physical action can be not just a movement of a piece of wood, it can actually be taking a turn in the game of chess. But you need to have agreed upon the idea that there is such a thing as the game. You need to have agreed upon the rules. But once you've done that, the action that's going on is not just physically moving an object, it's actually moving the pawn or capturing the knight with your bishop. Those sorts of things are actions that you can't do until there is a convention agreed. Similarly, scoring a touchdown is not just any sort of movement of a ball of a certain shape across a certain line. It only happens when there's a game in progress. And, uh, and so he's saying, a lot of actions have this feature. It's not just the performatives that we do with words, it's many things that we do with many sorts of objects. So the first rule for any performative is then that the convention invoked must exist and be accepted. And the second rule, also a very obvious one, is that the circumstances in which we purport to invoke this procedure must be appropriate for its invocation. If this is not observed, then the act that we purport to perform would not come off. It will be, one might say, a misfire. So that is, if he says, say that you're just standing around at home with your fiance and uh, you say, I do to them. That doesn't actually make you married. It's only if you say, I do during a wedding ceremony and after the officiant who's performing the ceremony has asked the appropriate questions. And so he's saying, if you just are sitting at home and decide to say, I do, maybe you're pretending to get married, but that's misfired. Similarly, if you say, I promise to be there tomorrow, if you say that to a friend who has expressed some place that they're going to be tomorrow and some desire that you might be there, then saying, I promise to be there tomorrow will succeed in promising whether or not you have the actual intention to be there. But if you just were sitting home alone and you said, I promise to be there tomorrow, to no one in particular, about nothing in particular, uh, 
this would not have succeeded in promising anything. So these are examples of misfires. The, there has to be a convention by which these things can be done, and uh, you have to be in the right conditions. This will also be the case if, for example, we do not carry through the procedure, what it, whatever it may be, correctly and completely, without a flaw and without a hitch. If any of these rules are not observed, we say that the act which we purported to perform is void, without effect. If, for example, the purported act was an act of marrying, then we should say that we went through a form of marriage, but we did not actually succeed in marrying. So for instance, that might happen if for some reason you had your wedding ceremony and then discovered that no one had filled out any of the paperwork, the person who was standing there wasn't really an efficient, and uh, none of your guests had showed up. If all that happened, you might have thought you were marrying, but you didn't actually succeed. Here are some examples of this kind of misfire. Suppose that, living in a country like our own, we wish to divorce our wife. We may try standing her in front of us squarely in the room and saying, in a voice loud enough for all to hear, I divorce you. Now, this procedure is not accepted. We shall not thereby have succeeded in divorcing our wife, at least in this country and others like it. Here he's referring to, uh, under Islamic law in many countries, this is a sufficient way to, to do a divorce. I think talaq is the Arabic word for divorce. And uh, if uh, one of the standard ways by which a divorce is performed is that the husband and the wife are standing there in the room together and the husband says talaq, talaq, talaq. And by saying that, he actually causes the divorce to happen uh, without having to get any legal uh, uh, approval for this or without having to go through any process. And of course, this is very controversial in the modern world, whether that's an appropriate way to go through divorce. And divorce laws did change in the United States and the United Kingdom in the 10 or 20 years after uh, uh, this paper was written. Um, and those are controversial, but uh, that means the conditions under which a, an utterance can successfully count as divorcing have changed. It used to be first you had to go through several court cases to prove that certain conditions were satisfied. And only at the end of that, when you sign the paperwork, are you divorced. Whereas under the modern system in the United States, if both parties agree to be divorced, they can just sign the paperwork right away and get divorced. They don't have to go through some other process first. This is a case, this case of just saying I divorce you, where the convention, we should say, does not exist or is not accepted. Again, Suppose that picking sides at a children's party, I say, I pick George. But George turns red in the face and says, not playing. In that case, I plainly, for some reason or another, have not picked George, whether because there's no convention that you can pick people who aren't playing, or because George in the circumstances is an inappropriate object for the procedure of picking. Or consider the case in which I say, I appoint you consul. And it turns out that you have been appointed already. In that case, saying I appoint you consul doesn't make you consul. Or perhaps it may even transpire that you are a horse. This is a story about the Roman Emperor Caligula that uh, he liked his horse so much that he appointed the horse consul. Consul, of course, being the highest ranking authority figure within the Roman Empire other than the emperor himself. I think it's unclear whether he claimed to have done that, but it seems likely that had he done that, most people would not have said that the horse is in fact consul. They would have said the emperor is crazy. Although maybe the emperor is powerful enough that just by stating this, he actually makes it the case that this is an appropriate thing to do. Here again, we have the infelicity of inappropriate circumstances, inappropriate objects, or whatnot. Examples of flaws and hitches are perhaps scarcely necessary. One party in the marriage ceremony says, I will. The other says, I won't. In that case, the first person's I do was not sufficient to get married. You need to both do it. I say, I bet six pence, but nobody says done. Nobody takes up the offer. You don't actually make a bet unless one person says, I bet you, and another person says, okay, I'll take up. I'll take you up on that. Once both people have said those things, now the bet has been made, and now the people are obligated to pay up if the event happens. Undertaking that obligation is an act that is performed by words. Of course, it's a different act from the act of actually paying when it turns out to be true or false. 
But as he points out, it is the saying of the act and the saying of the uh, I'll take you that bet that actually consists in uh, undertaking that obligation. It doesn't matter what's actually going on in your head at the time you do it. In all these and other such cases, the act which we purport to perform or set out to perform is not achieved unless the full thing is done by the other people as well. But there's another and a rather different way in which this kind of utterance may go wrong. A good many of these verbal procedures are designed for use by people who hold certain beliefs or have certain feelings or intentions. And if you use one of these formulae when you do not have the requisite thoughts or feelings or intentions, then there is an abuse of the procedure. There is insincerity. He's going to distinguish abuse or insincerity from misfire. That is, so he says, take for example, the expression, I congratulate you. This is designed for use by people who are glad that the person addressed has achieved a certain feat, believe that he was personally responsible for the success and so on. If I say I congratulate you when I'm not pleased or when I don't believe that the credit was yours, then there is insincerity. But note what he's saying here. He's not saying that you didn't congratulate. He's saying you did congratulate, but you did it insincerely. And that's different from if you say, I congratulate you when there isn't a person around. In that case, you didn't actually congratulate anyone. There are certain conditions that are necessary for a performative act to succeed, but there are other conditions that are necessary for the act to be sincere. And when someone's being insincere, we say something's gone wrong, but it doesn't mean that they failed to do it. Someone who goes through the marriage ceremony and says, I do, while uh, secretly not actually wanting to be married, ends up married. Uh, similarly, someone who says, I promise to be there, and that, but intends not to show up, has promised and will have broken that promise if they don't show up, but uh, they've done so insincerely. Even if they do show up, they may have promised insincerely. Likewise, if I say I promise to do something without having the least intention of doing it or without believing it feasible, in those cases, he says it's insincere, but you've still promised. In these cases, there is something wrong, certainly, but it is not like a misfire. We should not say that I didn't in fact promise, but rather that I did promise, but promised insincerely. I did congratulate you, but the congratulations were hollow. And there may be an infelicity of a somewhat similar kind when the performative utterance commits the speaker to future conduct of a certain description, and then in the future he does not in fact behave in the expected way. This is very obvious, of course, if I promise to do something and then break my promise, but there are many kinds of commitment of a rather less tangible form than that in the case of promising. So note he's saying there's two ways for a promise to uh, go wrong even if it happens. If you say I promise, then you have promised, you might promise insincerely if you don't have the mental intention to do so. And you may break the promise if you don't show up. But these are two different conditions. You could promise insincerely, but then end up showing up anyway. Or you could promise sincerely, but then something comes up and you decide not to do it. Those are different kinds of failure, but both of them involve a promise that was made and in one case not fulfilled, in the other case, made insincerely, and these are different kinds of problem. And now he's going to give another example other than promising. For instance, I may say, I welcome you, bidding you welcome to my home or wherever it may be, but then I proceed to treat you as though you were exceedingly unwelcome. In this case, the procedure of saying, I welcome you, has been abused in a way rather different from that of simple insincerity. That is, saying, I welcome you, without wanting the person to be there, but then treating them well is one way of being insincere. Uh, but saying, I welcome you and intending to be sincere, but then continuing to go about your life and sort of ignoring them, that is, uh, that is not insincere, but it's still an abuse of the process of welcoming. Now we might ask whether this list of infelicities is complete, whether the kinds of infelicity are mutually exclusive and so forth. Well, it is not complete and they are not mutually exclusive. They never are. There's always going to be more conditions that we can think of and more ways for one of these performative acts to go wrong. Suppose that you are just about to name the ship. You've been appointed to name it and you are just about to bang the bottle against the stern. But at that very moment, some low type comes up, snatches the bottle out of your hand, breaks it on the stem, shouts, 
I name this ship the Generalissimo Stalin, and then for good measure, kicks away the chocks so that the ship just slides into the water. That is, this person has done what looks like the standard form of naming a ship. He's broken a champagne bottle again on it, said, I named the ship the Generalissimo Stalin, and then kicked away the support so that the ship sails off. That's what the normal person who has a, is appointed to name a ship does. Well, we agree, of course, on several things. We agree that the ship certainly isn't now named the Generalissimo Stalin, and we agree that it's an infernal shame and so on and so forth. But we may not agree as to how we should classify the particular infelicity in this case. We might say that here is a case of a perfectly legitimate and agreed procedure, which, however, has been invoked in the wrong circumstances, namely by the wrong person, this low type, instead of the person appointed to do it. But on the other hand, we might look at it differently and say this is a case where the procedure has not as a whole been gone through correctly, because part of the procedure for naming a ship is that you should first of all get yourself appointed as the person to do the naming, and that's what this fellow did not do. So here he's saying there's two ways to describe the problem. It could be the person did all the things that are necessary for naming the ship, but wasn't the right person. Or we might say, becoming the right person is one of the things that is part of the process, and he didn't do that. Thus, the way we should classify infelicities in different cases will be perhaps rather a difficult matter, and may even in the last resort be a bit arbitrary. It doesn't look like anything matters about whether we count being named the right person as a step in the process or as something that has to be done before the process actually begins. Either way, it's a thing that needs to happen in order for the process to work. But of course, lawyers who have to deal very much with this kind of thing have invented all kinds of technical terms and made numerous rules about different kinds of cases, which enable them to classify fairly rapidly what in particular is wrong in any given case for legal uh, performatives. As for whether this list is complete, it certainly is not. One further way in which things may go wrong is, for example, through what in general may be called misunderstanding. You may not hear what I say, or you may understand me to refer to something different from what I intended to refer to, and so on. So for instance, if I say, I bet you $5, you might think that I was betting on the last thing you said, but I might think I was betting on the thing that was said five minutes ago. And so there might be some miscommunication here. Apart from further additions, which we might make to the list, there is the general overriding consideration that as we are performing an act when we issue these performative utterances, we may of course be doing so under duress or in some other circumstances which make us not entirely responsible for doing what we are doing. That is, in many jurisdictions, if someone goes through the wedding ceremony and says I do, but can prove later that they were being threatened or blackmailed into doing it, then they can say, I didn't actually do it because I only pretended to do it. And the fact that it was under duress makes my performance void. That would certainly be an unhappiness of a kind. Any kind of non-responsibility might be called an unhappiness. But of course, it is quite a different thing from what we have been talking about. And I might mention that quite differently again, we could be issuing any of these utterances as we can issue an utterance of any kind whatsoever in the course, for example, of acting a play or making a joke or writing a poem. So for instance, in many plays, characters get married on stage. They go through the perfect form of the marriage ceremony, but everyone agrees that even if the actor who is playing the officiant is a legally licensed uh, uh, officiant, and even if the actors who are playing the uh, spouses in the play are fiancés, the act of doing this in the play doesn't succeed in marrying them. In which case, of course, so in this case, it would not be seriously meant and we shall not be able to say that we seriously performed the act concerned. If the poet says, go and catch a falling star or whatever it may be, he's, he doesn't seriously issue an order. Considerations of this kind apply to any utterance at all, not merely to performatives. That is, uh, when, whenever anyone in a play says things, whatever they're doing is not the same thing that ordinary people do when they say things with their normal meaning. It doesn't matter whether it's a performative or a constative, a statement. In any case, doing it within a play is somehow special. <laughs>
That then is perhaps enough to be going on with. We have discussed the performative utterance and its infelicities. That equips us, we may suppose, with two shining new tools to crack the crib of reality, maybe. It also equips us, it always does, with two shining new skids under our metaphysical feet. The question is how we use them. Okay, so now here he moves into part two. So far, we've been going firmly ahead, feeling the firm ground of prejudice glide away beneath our feet, which is always rather exhilarating. But what next? You will be waiting for the bit when we bog down, the bit where we take it all back. And sure enough, that's going to come, but it will take time. He's going to end up saying, there's not as much difference between these performances, performatives and ordinary statements as he's been suggesting so far. But I think in some ways, what he's going to suggest is actually ordinary statements are much more like performatives than we had thought. First of all, let us ask a rather simple question. How can we be sure? How can we tell uh, whether any utterance is to be classed as a performative or not? Surely we feel we ought to be able to do that. And we should obviously very much like to be able to say that there is a grammatical criterion for this, some grammatical means of deciding whether an utterance is performative. All the examples I've given hitherto do in fact have the same grammatical form. They all of them begin with the verb in the first person singular present indicative active. Not just any kind of verb, of course, but still they all are in fact of that form. So here he's thinking, it would be nice if there was some formal way to decide just by the words that someone is saying, whether they are making a statement or performing an action. And he's going to say, this is more problematic than that. By the end, I think he's going to be excited by that fact. The fact that we can't distinguish between these is going to suggest that we should think of even ordinary statements as performatives of a sort. And I think that's a really interesting way to think about things. And we'll see many theorists have taken that very far uh, following up on Austin. But Austin here is, I think, aiming for something a little bit more conservative. He's trying to say, there are some things that are statements. They're either true or false. There are other things that are performatives. Let's see, can we tell them apart? And he's going to suggest there's at least not a simple way of telling them apart. Furthermore, with these verbs that I've used, there's a typical, typical asymmetry between the use of this person in tense of the verb and the use of the same verb in other persons and other tenses. And this asymmetry is rather an important clue. For example, when we say, I promise that, the case is very different from when we say, he promises that or in the past tense, I promised that. For when we say, I promise that, we do perform an act of promising, we give a promise. What we do not do is to report on somebody's performing an act of promising. In particular, we, we do not report on somebody's use of the expression, I promise. That would be interesting. I think this is a thought that someone might object to right here. Someone might say, when you say, I promise to be there tomorrow, you are both doing the promising and also stating that you are doing the promising. Austin is denying that. And I think he doesn't have a good argument for denying it. Just intuitively, he thinks there is only one thing happening and it's doing the promising. Whereas when you say, I promised, when you say today, yesterday, I promised to be there tomorrow. Now I no longer intend to do that. In that case, you are reporting on the past promise but you are not making the promise anymore. Similarly, when uh, if, if I say, I promise to be there tomorrow, and someone who's watching just asks someone else, what did you just do? They might report, he promised, he promised to be there tomorrow, and they're there reporting on my promise. They are not making a promise or making my promise or whatever that would be. So he says, when I say I promise, we, act, we don't report on somebody's use of the expression. We actually do use it and do the promising. But if I say he promises, or in the past tense, I promised, I precisely do report on an act of promising. That is to say, an act of using this formula, I promise. I report on a present act of promising by him or on a past act of my own. There is thus a clear difference between our first person singular present indicative active and other per persons and tenses. This is brought out by the typical incident of little Willie, whose uncle says he'll give him half a crown if he promises never to smoke till he's 55. Little Willie's anxious parents will say, of course he promises, don't you Willie, giving him a nudge. And little Willie just doesn't say it. 
The point here is that he must do the promising himself by saying, I promise. And his parent is going too fast in saying he promises. This then is a bit of a test for whether an utterance is performative or not, but it would not do to suppose that every performative utterance has to take this standard form. There is at least one other standard form, every bit as common as this one, where the verb is in the passive voice and in the second or third person, not in the first. The sort of case I mean is that of a notion inscribed, passengers are warned to cross the line by the bridge only, or of a document reading, you are hereby authorized to do so-and-so. In this case, are warned or are authorized. These are passive voices of the verb and there is no subject of the verb given. Well, depending on how you classify subject or object of a passive verb. These are undoubtedly performative. And in fact, a signature is often required in order to show who it is that is doing the act of warning or authorizing or whatever it may be. For instance, the sign that says, passengers are hereby ordered uh, are warned to cross the line by the bridge only. Uh, that might say underneath it, uh, signed by the Regional Transport Council of Victoria or whatever. Very typical of this kind of performative, especially liable to occur in written documents, of course, is that the little word hereby either actually occurs or might naturally be inserted. So this is an interesting word, the word hereby. We have a whole bunch of words in English where you can put here, there, or where in front of a preposition. And uh, if you say hereby, you mean by means of this. If you say whereby, you mean by means of which. If you say thereby, you mean by means of that. And we can have herein, therein, wherein, any sort of preposition can get this sort of uh, uh, prefix. But hereby means by means of this. And the fact that you're saying by means of this is often a good sign that the utterance itself, the thing by means of which this is being stated, is in fact doing the act. Uh, so for instance, you are hereby authorized to do so-and-so. You are authorized by this very statement to do st so-and-so. That suggests the statement is actually doing the authorizing. Unfortunately, however, we still can't possibly suggest that every utterance which is to be classed as a performative has to take one or another of these two, as we might call them, standard forms. After all, it would be a very typical performative utterance to say, I order you to shut the door. This satisfies all the criteria. It is performing the act of ordering you to shut the door and it is not true or false. But in the appropriate circumstances, surely we could perform exactly the same act by simply saying, shut the door in the imperative. That is now he's saying imperatives are performatives as well. So that's a third grammatical form they can take. Or again, suppose that somebody sticks up a notice, this bull is dangerous, or simply dangerous bull or simply bull. Does this necessarily differ from sticking up a notice appropriately signed saying, you are hereby warned that this bull is dangerous? It seems that the simple notice bull can do just the same job as the more elaborative formula. Of course, the difference is that if we just stick up bull, it would not be quite clear that it is a warning. It might be there just for interest or information, like wallaby on the cage at the zoo or ancient monument. So that is, he's saying, if you just stick up a sign with a single word on it, in some context, people will understand that this is just a label. That's one act that the sign can be performing. But another act that the sign can be performing is a warning. No doubt we should know from the nature of the case that it was a warning, but it would not be explicit. So that is, some performatives make very clear by means of the verb that they use, what act is being performed. I promise to be there tomorrow. But sometimes you can do it without using that verb. Be there tomorrow uh, or bull, that performs an act of warning. Uh, or no entry that performs an act of forbidding. These are acts that can be performed by words, even though the act is not stated in the word itself. I mean, the traditional wedding expression, I do, is another example of that, though it's often I do in response to a statement that involves the verb of marrying. Well, in view of this breakdown of grammatical criteria, 
what we should like to suppose, and there's a good deal on this, is that any utterance which is performative could be reduced or expanded or analyzed into one of these two standard forms beginning I, so-and-so, or beginning you or he, hereby, is in the passive, so-and-so. So that is, he's hoping, first thought was, all performatives have this standard grammatical form. He says, that's not true. Second thought, maybe not all performatives have that grammatical form, but all performatives could be translated into that grammatical form. And then he says, if there was any justification for this hope, as to some extent there is, then we might hope to make a list of all the verbs which could appear in the standard forms, and then we might classify the kinds of acts that can be performed by performative utterances. We might do this with the aid of a dictionary, using such a test as that already mentioned, whether there is the characteristic asymmetry between the first person singular present indicative active and the other person's intenses, in order to decide whether a verb is to go into our list or not. Now, if we make such a list of verbs, we do in fact find that they fall into certain fairly well-marked classes. There's the class of cases where we deliver verdicts and make estimates and appraisals of various kinds. So that's one class of types of performatives. There's the class where we give undertakings, commit ourselves in various ways by saying something. So I think the first kind, the verdicts or estimates or appraisals, those might be set things like where the umpire says out or where the uh, judge or, or the jury says guilty or not guilty. The class where we give undertakings or commit ourselves, these might be things where we say, I promise or I bet. There's the class where by saying something, we exercise various rights and powers, such as appointing and voting and so on. And there are one or two other fairly well-marked classes. So here he's saying, maybe we can classify all of the performatives. Suppose this task were accomplished. Then we could call these verbs in our list explicit performative verbs. And any utterance that was reduced to one or another of our standard forms, we could call an explicit, uh, explicit performative utterance. I order you to shut the door would be an explicit performative utterance, whereas shut the door would not. That is simply a primary performative utterance or whatever we like to call it. Here he's all saying, what would be the case if we were able to classify all the performatives? We could then say some of them are explicit performatives, some of them are implicit or primary performatives. In using the imperative, we may be ordering you to shut the door, but it just isn't made clear whether we are ordering you or entreating you or imploring you or beseeching you or inciting you or tempting you or one or another of many other subtly different acts, which in an unsophisticated primitive language are very likely not yet discriminated. So that is, he's saying there's many different performative acts that can be done with the imperative. Sometimes you make it explicit with your verb, but sometimes you don't and you hope that the person can figure out which of those acts you're doing. But we need not overestimate the unsophistication of primitive languages. There are a great many devices that can be used for making clear, even at the primitive level, what act it is we are performing when we say something. The tone of voice, cadence, gesture, and above all, we can rely on the nature of the circumstances, the context in which the utterance is issued. This very often makes it quite unmistakable whether it is an order that is being given or whether, say, I'm simply urging you or entreating you. We may, for instance, say something like this. Coming from him, I was bound to take it as an order. But we know imperatives aren't always making orders. If your friend said, uh, hears you talking about your boyfriend and says, break up with him, we don't normally think your friend is ordering you to break up with him. We think your friend is suggesting that you break up with him or advising that you break up with him. And advising and suggesting are different acts than commanding or ordering, even though they're often done with the same form of words. Still, in spite of all these devices, there is an unfortunate amount of ambiguity and lack of discrimination in default of our explicit performative verbs. That is, if we don't explicitly say, I order you to break up with him, or I suggest that you break up with him, or I advise you to break up with him, or I think it would be a good thing if you break up with him. If we don't say any of those, it's hard to tell which is, it's sometimes hard to tell which is being done. If I say something like, I shall be there, it may not be certain whether it is a promise or an expression of intention, or perhaps even just a forecast of my future behavior of what is going to happen to me. And it may matter a good deal, at least in developed societies, precisely which of these things it is.
That is, if it's a promise, and if you don't show up, you've broken your promise. Whereas if it's just an expression of your intention, uh, then if you don't show up, it just means you've changed your mind. It doesn't mean you broke a promise. And in some circumstances, it might matter whether what you did is breaking a promise or just being wrong about your prediction or uh, forming an intention and then changing your mind. This, he says, is why the explicit performative verb is evolved to make clear exactly which it is, how far it commits me and in what way and so forth. This is just one way in which language develops in tune with the society of which it is the language. Note that here he's saying the opposite of what people sometimes say about language. He's saying, if your society starts developing a distinction between promises and predictions and intentions, or between commands and orders and uh, suggestions and advice, advices, then, then our language will start developing words for them. Whereas some people say, if your language doesn't have certain words, then you can't have those concepts. He's saying, if you don't have those concepts, then you can't have those words. And that's an interesting question. Which direction does that go? But I think the idea might be that having those words makes it easier for people to learn the difference between the different concepts. But having those concepts is needed for the words to be developed. The social habits of the society may considerably affect the question of which performative verbs are evolved and which, sometimes for rather irrelevant reasons, are not. For example, if I say, you are a poltroon, it might be that I am censuring you or it might be that I am insulting you. Now, since apparently society approves of censuring or reprimanding, we have here evolved a formula, I reprimand you or I censure you, which enables us expeditiously to get this desirable business over. This is definitely a thing that happens explicitly in politics. Sometimes uh, a party or a branch of government will explicitly censure another person for doing something that they disapprove of. But on the other hand, since apparently we don't approve of insulting, we have not evolved the simple formula, I insult you, which might have done just as well. Think about that. The way you insult someone is by using words, but the words you use are always just a state in the grammatical form of a statement about them. You never say, I insult you, sir. Although that would be interesting if a language came up with that as a formula for insulting people. That would be interesting. By means of these explicit performative verbs and some other devices then, we make explicit what precise act it is that we are performing when we issue our utterance. But here I would like to put in a word of warning. We must distinguish between the function of making explicit what act it is we are performing and the quite different matter of stating what it is we are performing. In issuing an explicit performative utterance, we are not stating what act it is, we are showing or making explicit what act it is. We can draw a helpful parallel here with another case in which the act, the conventional act that we perform is not a speech act, but a physical performance. Suppose I appear before you one day and bow deeply from the waist. Well, this is ambiguous. I may simply be observing the local flora or tying my shoelace or something of that kind. On the other hand, conceivably I might be doing obeisance to you. Well, to clear up this ambiguity, we have some device such as raising the hat, saying salam or something of that kind to make it quite plain that the act being performed is a conventional one of doing obeisance rather than some other act. Now, nobody would want to say that lifting your hat was stating that you're performing an act of obeisance. It certainly is not, but it does make it quite plain that you are. And so in the same way to say, I warn you that, or I order you to, or I promise that, is not to state that you are doing something, but makes it plain that you are. It does constitute your verbal performance, a performance of a particular kind. So here, I think he's making an argument that these performatives are not statements of what they're doing, they are merely doings. And I think his argument is, in many physical acts, there may be some physical signal that we give that indicates what kind of act we're doing, but that physical signal is not a statement of what the act is. And similarly, he says, that's what's going on here. Though I think he doesn't defeat the idea that the grammatical form looks like a statement, and so by default, we should treat it as a statement. This is something that some other philosophers have said in response to Austin. They have said, he's just mistaken here. But I think this is an interesting point to think about. Are we both 
making the promise and stating that we're making the promise when we say I promise, or are we just making the promise? I think it would be interesting to think about what would it take to make that difference? Um, sometimes people put the idea that a performative is a statement that can't help but be true when it's stated in certain ways. Others say a performative is a statement that is not true or false, but just does what it says. So far, we've been going along as though there was a quite clear difference between our performative utterances and what we have contrasted with them with, statements or reports or descriptions. But now we begin to find that this distinction is not as clear as it might be. It's now that we begin to sink in a little. In the first place, of course, we may feel doubts as to how widely our performatives extend. If we think up some odd kinds of expressions we use in odd cases, we might very well wonder whether or not they satisfy our rather vague criteria for being performative utterances. Suppose, for example, somebody says, hurrah. Well, it's not true or false. He's performing the act of cheering. Does that make it a performative utterance in our sense or not? Or suppose he says, damn, he is performing the act of swearing and it is not true or false. Does that make it performative? We feel that in a way it does, and yet it's rather different. I should say, I personally don't get the difference. To me, this just seems like a straightforward sort of performative. Again, consider cases of suiting the action to the words. These two may make us wonder whether perhaps the utterance should be classed as performative. I'm not sure exactly what he's talking about there. Or sometimes if somebody says, I am sorry, we wonder whether this is just the same as I apologize, in which case, of course, we should, we've said it's a performative utterance, or whether it's perhaps to be taken as a description, true or false, of the state of his feelings. This might be a distinction between British and North American English. I think in North American English, the traditional way to perform apologizing is to say, I'm sorry. And it's very odd to even think about that statement as a report on what you are uh, feeling uh, in the same way that good morning is standardly taken to be a performative as the act of greeting rather than a statement, this morning is good. Um, I think, uh, uh, and maybe this is a way that the language has evolved uh, since 1962. If he had said, I feel perfectly awful about it, then we should think that it is meant to be a description of the state of his feelings. Just like if someone asks you, uh, are you doing all right right now? It looks, sounds like they're actually asking you how you're doing as opposed to someone who says, how are you doing? You don't think that they're actually asking you how you're doing. You think that they're just greeting you. If he had said, I apologize, we should feel this was clearly a performative utterance going through the ritual of apologizing. But if he says, I'm sorry, there's an unfortunate hovering between the two. And again, maybe that's accurate in 1962 in the UK, but here in the United States in the present, I think saying I'm sorry is clearly performing an act of apologizing. It is not merely stating that your feelings. This phenomenon is quite common. So I think whether or not that case is one, there are cases where it's really unclear whether you're making a statement or performing an act. I think on the dam and hurrah case, he's saying there doesn't seem to be a way to put that into the uh, first person indicative. You can't say, I damn you, or I celebrate you for uh, as a replacement for dam or hurrah. Uh, the, but he's already noted you also can't do that with insulting. There's no way to say, I insult you. Uh, there are ways to insult by using words. And so those, I think, are all performatives, but they can't fit into this grammatical criterion. And I think that is the and a major point for him. He at first thought maybe we could grammatically identify the performatives and then say anything that is equivalent to a statement in that grammatical form is also a performative. But now he's pointing out the boundaries are much blurrier. We often find cases in which there is an obvious pure performative utterance and obvious other utterances connected with it which are not performative but descriptive, but on the other hand, a good many in between where we're not sure which they are. On some occasions, of course, they are obviously used the one way, on some occasions the other way, but on some occasions they seem positively to revel in ambiguity. Again, I'm not sure why he says again here because he hasn't considered these before. Consider the case of the um umpire when he says out or over. Uh, 
over is a critic, cricket term, or the jury's utterance when they say that they find the prisoner guilty. Of course, we say these are cases of giving verdicts, performing the act of appraising and so forth. But still, in a way, they have some connection with the facts. They seem to have something like the duty to be true or false and seem not to be so very remote from statements. If the umpire says over, this surely has at least something to do with six balls, in fact, having been delivered rather than seven and so on. In the rules of cricket, once the pit bat once the, what's they call it, the pitcher? Or is that the, I forget if that's the term. Once he's thrown the ball six times, they say over. And uh, if he's only done it three times and the umpire says over, people would say the umpire is doing something wrong. He's, he, something has gone wrong with his utterance. Although whether it failed or whether it was done incorrectly might be hard to determine. Similarly, think about a case in baseball where the uh, player clearly reached the base in time, but the umpire says out. Or pick your favorite sport, think about a case where the referee has called it wrong. I think in some sports, I think in soccer, for instance, the rules are that whatever the referee says is actually how it goes, even if the referee is clearly wrong. In other sports, they have the use of the instant replay and that can overrule the referee. And so that's an interesting difference in the rules of the sports, which might make an interesting difference in the way that those performatives work. But in all of those cases, they're supposed to line up with the facts. And there's just a difference in what happens when they don't. In fact, in general, we may remind ourselves that I state that does not look so very different from I warn you that or I promise to. It makes clearly, surely that the act that we are performing is an act of stating and so functions just like I warn or I order. So isn't I state that a performative utterance? But then one may feel that utterances beginning I state that do have to be true or false, that they are statements. Considerations of this sort then may well make us feel pretty unhappy. If we look back for a moment at our contrast between statements and performative utterances, we realize that we were taking statements very much on trust from, as we said, the traditional treatment statements we had it were to be true or false. Performative utterances, on the other hand, were to be felicitous or infelicitous. They were the doing of something, whereas for all we said, making statements was not doing something. Now this contrast, surely, if we look back at it, is unsatisfactory. Of course, statements are liable to be assessed in this manner of their correspondence or failure to correspond with the facts that is being true or false but they are also liable to infelicity every bit as much as our performative utterances. In fact, some troubles that have arisen in the study of statements recently can be shown to be simply troubles of infelicity. For example, it has been pointed out that there is something very odd about saying something like this. The cat is on the mat, but I don't believe it is. Now this is an outrageous thing to say, but it is not self-contradictory. There is no reason why the cat shouldn't be on the mat without my believing that it is. We can certainly think of cases where for other people, it's been true that the cat's been on the mat, but they didn't believe it is. We can think of cases where that's been true of ourselves in the past, and it might be true of myself for right now for all I know, but it's still very weird to say it. And what's going wrong? This is often called Moore's paradox because G.E. Moore made a great deal out of this. These are statements that look awful, but are not contradictory. So how are we to classify what's wrong with this particular statement? If we remember now the doctrine of infelicity, we shall see that the person who makes this remark about the cat is in much the same position as somebody who says something like this. I promise that I shall be there, but I haven't the least intention of being there. Once again, you can, of course, perfectly well promise to be there without having the least intention of being there, but there's something outrageous about saying it, about actually avowing the insincerity of the promise you give. In the same way, there is insincerity in the case of the person who says the cat is on the mat, but I don't believe it is. And he is actually avowing that insincerity, which makes a particular kind of nonsense. So here's what he's saying. He says performatives have felicity conditions and they have sincerity conditions. There are certain conditions under which they fail to happen, other conditions under which they fail to be sincere. You're supposed to do the sincere thing, but if you don't do the sincere thing, you've still done the act. With statements, he's saying, there's similarly a sincerity condition. You're supposed to believe what you're saying. And if you don't believe what you're saying, then you haven't been sincere. And he says, there's something 
really outrageous about performing an act while acknowledging your insincerity in performing that act. And that's what he thinks is going wrong in Moore's paradox. And for that, in order for there to be sincerity conditions, he suggests that means statements are in many ways just like performatives. They have sincerity conditions, not just truth conditions. Uh, a second case that has come to light is the one about John's children. The case where somebody is supposed to say, all John's children are bald, but John hasn't got any children. Or perhaps somebody says, all John's children are bald, when as a matter of fact, he doesn't say so, John has no children. Now, those who study statements have worried about this. Ought they to say that the statement, all John's children are bald, is meaningless in this case? This is an interesting case. Logicians traditionally say the statement, all John's children are bald, is true when John hasn't got any children. But ordinarily, people say, that seems weird. The statement seems like it has a worse problem. It's, it's not just simply true. It seems like there's something wrong with it. Well, if it is, it's not a bit like a great many other kind, more standard kinds of meaninglessness. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it's meaningless to say all John's children are bald, the way that it might be meaningless to say colorless green ideas sleep furiously. We see, if we look back at our list of infelicities, that what is going wrong here is much the same as what goes wrong in, say, the case of a contract for the sale of a piece of land when the piece of land referred to does not exist. Now, what we say in the case of this sale of land, which of course would be affected by a performative utterance, is that the sale is void, void for lack of reference or ambiguity of reference. And so we can see that the statement about all John's children is likewise void for lack of reference. And if the man actually says that John has no children in the same breath as saying they're all bald, he is making the same kind of outrageous utterance as the man who says, the cat is on the mat and I don't believe it is, or the man who says, I promise to, but I don't intend to. And this is the sort of thing that uh, I think helps us understand if we think back to cases that Frege discusses where a name doesn't have a reference. Frege is saying, those sentences are neither true nor false when the name has no reference. And I think maybe Austin would say, all the names referring is one of the felicity conditions or sincerity conditions or something like that for a statement. And that you somehow failed to properly make a statement if you used a name that doesn't actually have a reference. That's at least one thought about how this goes. And I think it's something to consider. It's different from being either true or being false. In this way then, ills that have been found to afflict statements can be precisely paralleled with ills that are characteristic of performative utterances. And after all, when we state something or describe something or report something, we do perform an act, which is every bit as much an act as an act of ordering or warning. There seems no good reason why stating should be given a specially unique position. So here, I think he's making an argument that statements really are performatives. They have one feature in common, they have felicity conditions, and now they are doings. Of course, philosophers have been wont to talk as though you or I or anybody could just go around stating anything about anything and that would be perfectly in order. Only there's just a little question, is it true or false? That is, many philosophers of language have thought statements just have to be grammatical. You're supposed to be trying to say true things, but that's all that matters. But besides the little question, is it true or false? There is surely the question, is it in order? I think here he's suggesting things that Grice is going to suggest much more explicitly in later years, that truth isn't the only thing. Truth is just one of the conditions that we usually look for in a statement. Can you go around just making statements about anything? Suppose, for example, you say to me, I'm feeling pretty moldy this morning. I don't know what it means to feel moldy, but I'm sure it's bad. And I think that's just, he's not commenting on that. He's just accepting feeling moldy as the sort of thing that a British person might have said in 1962. And then, well, I say to you, you're not. And you say, what the devil do you mean I'm not? I say, oh, nothing. I'm just stating you're not. Is it true or false? And you say, wait a bit about whether it's true or false. The question is, what did you mean by making statements about somebody else's feelings? I told you I'm feeling pretty moldy. You're just not in a position to say, to state that I'm not. This brings out that you can't just make statements about other people's feelings, that you can make guesses if you like. And there are many things which having no knowledge of, not being in a position to pronounce about, you just can't state. So I think here he's suggesting statements aren't just the sort of things that are supposed to be true or false. 
if you make a statement about somebody else's feelings, you're probably doing something wrong, even if you are stating the truth. And that, he thinks, is evidence that there are felicity conditions for statements about people's feelings. It's appropriate for a person to make statements about their own feelings, and it's appropriate to make guesses, perhaps sometimes, about other people's feelings. But to just state other people's feelings is often a mistake. And I think many people can think of many other examples that have forms like this, statements that seem wrong to make, even if they might be true or false. What we need to do for the case of stating, and by the same token, describing and reporting, is to take them a bit off their pedestal, to realize that they are speech acts, no less than all these other speech acts that we've been mentioning and talking about as performative. Then let us look for a moment at our original contrast between the performative and the statement from the other side. In handling performatives, we've been putting it all the time as though the only thing that a performative utterance had to do was to be felicitous, to come off, not to be a misfire, not to be an abuse. Yes, but that's not the end of the matter, at least in the case of many utterances which, on what we have said, we should have to class as performative, cases where we say, I warn you to, I advise you to, and so on. There will be other questions besides simply, was it in order? Was it all right as a piece of advice or a warning? Did it come off? After that, surely there will be the question, was it good or sound advice? Was it a justified warning? Or in the case, let us say, of a verdict or an estimate, was it a good estimate or a sound verdict? And these are questions that can only be decided by considering how the content of the verdict or estimate is related in some way to fact or to evidence available about the facts. That is to say that we do require to assess at least a great many performative utterances in a general dimension of correspondence with fact. It may still be said, of course, that this does not make them very like statements, because still they are not true or false. And that's a little black and white specialty that distinguishes statements as a class apart. But actually, though it would take too long to go on about this, the more you think about truth and falsity, the more you find that very few statements that we ever utter are just true or just false. Usually there is the question, are they fair or are they not fair? Are they adequate or not adequate? Are they exaggerated or not exaggerated? Are they too rough or are they perfectly precise, accurate, and so on? This is where we might be getting into the Grice stuff very explicitly. True and false are just general labels for a whole dimension of different appraisals which have something or other to do with the relation between what we say and the facts. If then we loosen up our ideas of truth and falsity, we shall see that statements when accessed in relation to the facts are not so very different after all from pieces of advice, warnings, verdicts, and so on. So initially he said, performatives do things, statements say, state things and are true or false. But now here he's pointing out, some performatives have as their conditions that they are supposed to correspond to the world correctly. Things like saying out or safe or guilty or not guilty. And conversely, statements have to do more than just be true or false. And being true or false may not be the most important thing about them. There may be other conditions of appropriateness. And so he says, maybe we should combine these two categories, performatives and statements. Statements are just a type of performative. And maybe they're a type of performative that has an especially strong connection with truth and falsity. But all performatives have some amount of connection with truth or falsity. And statements just focus more on that than others, but not to the exclusion of other appropriateness conditions. This is, I think, the picture he wants us to have, which in some ways is a very radical picture, but in some ways I think makes a lot of sense. We see then that stating something is performing an act just as much as is giving an order or giving a warning. And we see on the other hand, that when we give an order or a warning or a piece of advice, there is a question about how this is related to fact, which is not perhaps so very different from the kind of question that arises when we discuss how a statement is related to fact. Well, this seems to mean that in its original form, our distinction between the performative and the statement is considerably weakened and indeed breaks down. I will just make a suggestion as to how to handle this matter. We need to go very much farther back to consider all the ways and senses in which saying anything at all is doing this or that, because of course it is always doing a good many different things. And one thing that emerges when we do do this is that 
besides the question that has been very much studied in the past as to what a certain utterance means, there's a further question distinct from this as to what was the force, as we may call it, of the utterance. We may be quite clear what shut the door means, but not yet at all clear on the further point as to whether as uttered at a certain time, it was an order, an entreaty, a suggestion, advice, or whatnot. What we need besides the old doctrine about meanings is a new doctrine about all the possible forces of utterance towards the discovery of which our proposed list of explicit performative verbs would be a very great help. And then going on from there, an investigation of the various terms of appraisal that we use in discussing speech acts of this, that, or the other precise kind, orders, warnings, and the like. The notions that we have considered then are the performative, the infelicity, the explicit performative, that is the one where you say, I, and then use the verb. And lastly, rather hurriedly, the notion of the forces of utterances. I dare say that all this seems a little unremunerative, a little complicated. Well, I suppose in some ways it is unremunerative, that is, it doesn't pay off. And I suppose it ought to be remunerative. At least though, I think that if we pay attention to these matters, we can clear up some mistakes in philosophy. And after all, philosophy is used as a scapegoat. It parades mistakes, which are really the mistakes of everybody. We might even clear up some mistakes in grammar, which perhaps is a little more respectable. And is it complicated? Well, it is complicated a bit, but life and truth and things do tend to be complicated. It's not things, it's philosophers that are simple. You will have heard it said, I expect, that oversimplification is the occupational disease of philosophers. And in one way, one might agree with that. Except for a sneaking suspicion that it's not the occupational disease, it's in fact their occupation. And there he just leaves off. So uh, I think he's saying, maybe we should really reconceive how we've been thinking about language. It's not about statements that are true or false. It's about things we do. And uh, he's given us a couple arguments. First, that there are performatives. Second, that uh, the lack of the internal mental state isn't the same as failing to perform the utterance or failing to perform the act. It's just failing to be sincere, that there's a distinction between sincerity conditions and actual success conditions. And uh, then he further goes on to try to categorize a bunch of these. He suggests we might have thought that maybe there's an explicit grammatical form, that there's an explicit list of words that are performative. But when he tries to do that, he notes first, plenty of utterances that don't have that form are really performative. And there's even some like insulting that and maybe damning and hurrahing that don't have a form that is of that standard type. And so we shouldn't expect them to have a standard form. But then he goes on to say, maybe everything's really a performative and statements are just one kind of performative, one that is more connected with truth or falsity than others. But there are many others that are connected with truth or falsity to varying degrees. And that maybe truth or falsity shouldn't be taken to be as important as we had thought. All of this is interesting and we'll discuss later where that leaves us.